Well, very good afternoon, morning, evening, depending on which time zone you're in to everyone. Thank you very much for attending. We're going to be talking about the IFRAO fee labelling manual. I have a PowerPoint presentation, but I'll also be doing some practical examples in Formpack. So today I'm going to be talking about the IFRAO fee labelling manual. What has changed in this year's release? How to update the data manually into Formpack? Considerations for updating the data automatically, updating the composition of natural complex substances, what happens with plus customers, and a conclusion. So, IFRA is the International Fragrance Association, and IOV is the International Organization of the Flavor Industry. Industry experts from uh, both flavors and fragrance form the GHS task force, which reviews available data and concludes appropriate GHS classifications and transport classifications for the benefit of our whole industries. Many of the people who do this um, are volunteers and uh, so they may be employed by fragrance houses or flavor houses, but they volunteer their time to do this. So big shout out to them and thank you for the uh, for the information, which is a benefit to many people. The labeling manual is issued as a spreadsheet to IFRA and IOFI members, and it has three tabs. It's proprietary information, so it shouldn't be shared with non-members. However, if you contact IFRA, they're usually happy to issue the labelling manual to non-members upon request. The three tabs of the spreadsheet represent chemicals on tab one, and there's 1,777 entries in the 2022 issue labelling manual. On tab two, there are 278 natural complex substances. So these are essential oils and related um, entities. And in tab three, there's the composition of the natural complex substances listed in there. So tab one and tab two are fairly similar, except um, tab one for chemicals, tab two for natural complex substances. The information contained within is uh, is quite similar. So <clears throat> this is the, what tab one looks like. So we see the headings across the top. We have some identifiers, a principal name, the GHS classification. So that's the, um, the UN GHS GHS classification and not any variant such as CLP or OSHA. That has a statement codes, various other GHS properties, signal words and pictograms. Uh, there's a footnote section, those appear at the bottom of the sheet, synonyms of the chemicals and some physical properties, flashpoint hydrocarbon and transport properties. There's also here a transport change indicator. So that indicates if there's been a change since the last year's issue of the labeling manual. And also over here, there's a GHS change indicator, which shows if there's been a change of classification. Sheet two has fairly similar headings, but it's for natural complex substances. So we see here that there's some uh, essential oils uh, and it has transport data and change indicators in the same way. So the footnotes that appear at the bottom of the sheet just give out some uh, some further information about the particular items that have the footnote code. And then on the third sheet, we see that there are compositions for natural complex substances. So each of these constituents in column D appears in 
the uh, natural complex substance named in column B uh, with the amount in column E and the classification. Just kind of hiding in column G and amongst all the overlapping GHS data, we can see that there's change indicators there as well for if the composition has changed. By reviewing the change and composition change indicators, it's possible to see which entries have changed since the previous year's labeling manual. So in tab one, there are 84 amendments to the GHS classification with 55 additions to the GHS, 15 transport amendments and 55 transport additions. In tab two, 32 GHS amendments, zero additions, 73 transport amendments and zero additions. It isn't possible to see from this year's labelling manual what last year's entry was without looking at the sheet that was issued for the previous year. So here's an example. In this year's labelling manual, LM 2022, we see that the US, uh, UN GHS classification in column K for this item, L cysteine, is acute tox 4. If we were to look at the previous year's sheet, we'd see it said not classified. So updating the data manually in form pack with the GHS hazards. I'm going to demonstrate how to do that. Modify raw material. We see in the left hand search box, you don't have to add a complete um, words into the smart search. We want to modify raw material. And search by name. L Sisti. So having found the item in the GHS classification column, we see that it says acute tox for oral. And so we go to the properties tab and select GHS hazards. And we can see that as per last year's labeling manual, there's no classification data there. I'm going to put acute tox oral four as the property. And I'm going to change that to yes. If we then check along in the sheet, we find that there's another property that has a value LD50 oral. So that's related to the acute toxicity hazard. So this is um, the LD50 data that we need to add. LD50 oral and I put in the numeric value from the sheet 1890 milligrams per kilogram. Okay. So then having checked, there's no more hazard or um, specific levels to add, then I can. Just calculate the hazards and we'll see that just by adding the hazard property and the LD50 there, that it's automatically populated the signal word warning, the pictogram exclamation mark, the age code harmful if swallowed and various P statements relating to it. So there's um, 
there's minimal information that you have to add if you just add the, the top line hazards and any specific limits which are associated with those, then many of the properties are automatically calculated. And we can see in this column here is calculated the manual ones that we've added and the rest are calculated. I would probably um, update that to reflect this year's data. So we can see that if we look now at the CLP hazards, so these are the hazards specific to CLP and not just uh, UNGHS, we see that acute tox 4 also appears in CLP and it's the same property in this instance. So there's no further data to add for CLP. The signal word and pictogram are also calculated for CLP. And the same applies for OSHA. If there are GHS hazards that don't apply in either of those um, specific regions, then they wouldn't appear. For example, skin irritation three is a GHS hazard, but it doesn't appear in CLP. So if we were to add SCI three in GHS, it wouldn't appear in the CLP hazards property group. So just to conclude, the data that needs entering from the labeling manual are just the hazards, any specific limits relating to those such as LD50, LC50, ATE, or the specific target organ, roots and organs, and any M factors for the environmental hazards. There is a footnote to mention that um, some entries in the labelling manual have a specific concentration limit, but the labelling manual itself doesn't contain that data. So if there are specific limits for any items, they need to be sourced elsewhere. Um, a good source is the ECHA website in the, uh, for Europe, and then that data can also be applied manually. A handy tool to help convert um, the labeling manual entry into the codes used in form pack is the GHS poster, which is available to download from the form pack support center. And so we can see here that uh, the conversion for acute toxicity oral four is mentioned in this second column here, ATO4. So it's uh, a handy tool for converting labeling manual data into the properties required to be added in form pack. I'll just pop that in the chat for those that would like to download it. Thanks very much, Cheryl. Thank you. So because the labeling manual data is standard GHS, um, data, there are inevitably differences in regional GHS implementations such as CLP and OSHA. So usually there's no action to take if the hazards are relevant to CLP or OSHA or GB, then they're included in the property groups and are automatically calculated. So as I said before, SCI3 is a GHS hazard but not a CLP one, so it would appear in GHS but not in CLP. Sometimes there's a slightly different link between the properties, so you need to be slightly cautious as to um, which property you're adding. Uh, and an example of this is where GHS and OSHA GHS both include eye damage irritation 2A and 2B whereas CLP only includes eye damage irritation 2, which is equivalent to 2A. 
Therefore, in the labeling manual, a GHS entry of EDI 2B will be ignored in CLP and a GHS entry of EDI 2A will automatically convert to EDI 2 in CLP. If you're manually entering data, from example, um, a CLP safety data sheet, if a CLP safety data sheet says EDI 2, then that means the GHS hazard EDI 2A. So it's still good practice to add EDI 2A in GHS, even if the source data says something slightly different. So raw materials which have a composition usually have their hazards calculated from those components, um, and that includes natural complex substances. So um, as we've seen from uh, sheet two of the labeling manual, there are also hazards listed for natural complex substances. So it's possible that the hazards get um, calculated from the components, but also applied manually. So where possible, it's good to avoid doing this. Um, so for example, uh, a natural complex substance might have a calculated value of environmental hazard chronic two, but also a manually applied value of environmental hazard chronic one. Usually it's not too much of a problem. It just, um, it usually just takes the, the most severe hazard into account, but it's good to avoid it just from a tidiness point of view. Also bear in mind that the labeling manual is just one data source. Um, there's other, other sources such as supplier data, reach registration data, uh, ECHA CNL inventory data, all might have some relevance to your products. Transport hazards. So similarly, um, these are often calculated from uh, hazardous components where there are some. However, simple raw materials don't have uh, a composition from which to calculate. So transport data can be applied manually. So we see in this case that citronella allosibutyrate has got class 9 UN3082 packing group 3 listed in the labeling manual. So we can apply that to the item in form pack. So here's the entry. And if we look over to the right where the transport is, we can see that there's been a transport change indicated by the X in AJ161. And it says class 9, packing group 3, UN3082. Modify raw material, citronella isobutyrate. And this time click the properties tab and click transport hazards. And we can see there's a few calculated properties, but there's no transport classification there. So I'm going to add the UN number into property trans ID. Property trans class as transport class, which in this case is class nine. And trans PG is the packing group.
than as before. If I calculate now, we'll see that um, lots of other properties are calculated from that, such as the proper shipping name. So the, there's not a requirement to add uh, full transport information, just the UN number, class and packing group. Occasionally, there's an additional uh, entry in the transport section if there's a sub risk. So in the example in the screenshot here, we can see that trans class is three, so it's flammable, but there's also a sub risk of toxic 6.1. So that's added into the property trans SR1 transport sub risk, and then the proper shipping name is calculated as flammable liquid toxic NOS. It's estimated that it might take um, around 40 to 50 hours to manually review and update all of the data contained in the 2022 labeling manual. So it's quite a big undertaking to try and update all of the data manually. Regional classification differences. OK, so. This is slightly different from calculating across um, the different property groups. This is more where a different region has a different classification from another, so it's. It's triggering a different property rather than calculating the same one. And an example of this is uh, D limonene where the harmonized classification in the EU uh, is environmental hazard chronic three under CLP. But the harmonized classification in GB is environmental hazard chronic one. Um, so that doesn't say much for harmonizing the classifications. So the reality is that if we just apply the GHS property EHC3 for chronic three, then the, the properties calculating through to the other property groups would be the same. But it's now possible to select a different classification just for GB on the, the items that have a different classification. So we could, of course, set up a completely new set of properties for all the different regions within FormPack, but that would mean that the data wouldn't transfer from from one set to another, and that would mean quadrupling the data entry. So we've we've kept the uh, the link, so that you still inherit the same GHS property values where relevant, unless you set a different classification specifically. And um, currently there's only um, property set up for changing the GBGHS environmental classification. And we've recently added the possibility to add a different classification for OSHA GHS in the area of reprotoxic. And that's to manage the difference in BMHCA, where the EU has classified it as Rep 1B. So it's important to note that um, if there's any automated data import from the labeling manual, the, the manual change to uh, EHC1 raw property for GB will also be necessary. Just going to demonstrate that now. So here we see D limonene. If we look at the GHS hazards, 
we see there's a whole bunch of things listed, including EH acute one, EH chronic three. So looking across to CLP, we see the same EHA1, EHC3. And if we look at GB, it's currently the same EHA1, EHC3. So if I change that to EHC1 raw and uncheck the calculated box because there's an accumulator in the composition. Change the property to yes. When I calculate now, we see that the GB classification has changed to EHC1. But the CLP and GHS still remain EHC3. So if we print a CLP safety data sheet, we see that d has EHC3 listed in the hazards. And if we print a GB GHS SDS variant, um, which hasn't been issued yet, but uh, it's uh, it's very soon going to be available as an optional. So if you uh, if you want to request that, then please let us know. And we can see here that in the hazards for that, it's now reflecting chronic one. And that's the example I've just shown. Okay, so 40 to 50 hours um, manually updating the labeling manual data in form pack is uh, quite a large undertaking. And so it's possible to have um, a cast matching process um, and then an import of the data. Uh, GHS classifications and the transport data from the chemicals and natural complex substances tabs one and two into your form pack system. So the basic process of this is that um, you the user exports a raw material list from your form pack system and send it to us. We then match the cast numbers from that list against the LM reference data. And that gives us an output spreadsheet, which is checked by you, the customer, um, to remove any duplicates. That's because some cast numbers represent more than one item. So, for example, orange peel sweet and orange essence oil have the same cast number in the labeling manual. And so it's important to select the correct one so that the appropriate data is added to the right item in your form pack system. So when those um, when that checking and duplicate removal has been done, then we can import the GHS and transport data into your system for those items. Unfortunately, it's not possible for us at form pack to automatically update natural complex substance compositions apart from any plus customers which have managed data. I'll talk a bit more about those in a minute. And it's because we can only import a complete composition. We can't just import some components and um, very many natural complex substance compositions include accumulator setups such as allergens and IFRA and these would all be disrupted if we were just to import the labeling manual components. So based on the time it takes for form pack to run this cast matching process, there's a charge of 600 pounds, which may be more that more cost effective than spending the 40 to 50 hours, which is um, slightly slightly over a week's work 
updating the classifications manually. So please contact if that's us if there's if that's of any interest to you. So updating the composition. So for for uh, most regular form pack customers, this is something that will need to be done manually. So I'll just give us a little example of how to do that here. And we do that in modify of raw material composition. So we see from here that carnation absolute has got three change indicators, sorry, four change indicators next to benzyl alcohol, benzyl benzoate, benzyl salicylate, and eugenol. So this um, this screenshot down here in the lower left, that's kind of like the before picture. And so when we look in form pack at carnation absolute, that's the picture we should see. So we change the values here just by double clicking on them and changing the numbers. To match the values in the latest labeling manual. And we can see that if we customize the screen, we can look at composition properties. Um, so the CLP category and hazard summary property. If we use the toggle bar to minimize the composition here, we can see the composition properties. So we see that this is the, the value of um, the category and hazard summary before I've done any calculations and the values for skin sensitizer and eye damage too. So if I now calculate the hazards based on the new composition data I've entered, we'll see that this classification changes. So we now have eye irritation two and the values for skin sensitization and, and eye damage two have changed. So it's clear that by changing the composition of the hazardous components, we've changed the classification of the mixture. So this is quite important to, um, when you're updating to consider the knock on effect on the documents that you might need to resupply. Further information about updating raw materials and raw material compositions is available in the form pack support center. And um, as I said at the start, if you click home up here on the left, just underneath the logo, you can see the support center pops up. Plus customers. So these are customers that, that pay for form pack to um, manage your data and this is done by ring fencing um, ingredients that appear in the labeling manual with their GHS and transport classifications and we kind of don't allow you to modify those but we do allow you to um, use them in formulations and other raw materials or copy the data from them and so because we keep them separate from any raw materials you might add yourself it's possible for us to automatically repopulate those items with new data and also ncs compositions because we know what those compositions all are and we can just uh, replace them with with new versions of those items So raw material data that's not included in the labeling manual um, 
as I mentioned before, there's specific concentration limits that are not mentioned, and uh, sometimes they need to be um, they need to be added. Uh, reach numbers are specific to a customer's supply chain, so those can only come from your supplier. Um, and flashpoint data may be optionally imported with the automated import process as the flashpoints listed in the labeling manual may differ from the grade that you're actually purchasing. So a few final thoughts. In the covering letter to um, the labeling manual, it states that uh, in line with established practice, the membership is encouraged to implement the new or modified classifications within six months of issue. So the labeling manual 2022 was issued January the 9th, 2023. So that means that by early July, uh, it would be good to have the data input. If you didn't update to the labeling manual 2021 data, then the GHS and transport change indicators may not reflect all the necessary changes in your system, in which case you might need to review the entire labeling manual sheet um, or request the data matching service, which would put all of the data into your system. So as we've seen, changes to the raw material GHS hazards will inevitably lead to formulation classification changes, which will trigger the resupply of any safety data sheets. But also uh, changes to the composition may also impact allergen declarations and IFRA certificates. Thank you very much for to everyone for attending. Um, I hope it's been useful. And uh, please enjoy the rest of your day, however much of it remains. <laughs>